Last week I played Pokemon Yellow with only Raichu, one of the worst Pokemon to solo the game with. And at the very end of that video, I said that there was another Pokemon that was potentially just as irredeemable. And that Pokemon is Executor. So today we're going to examine how it does in a solo challenge. Playthrough rules can be found in the description, please check them out if you're new to my content. Without wasting any time, let's talk about why Executor is so bad. And it all comes down to its move pool. It starts with Barrage and Hypnosis, a truly awful set to defeat Brock with. And then through level up, it only learns one move, Stomp at level 28. If you're wondering why this is the case, it's probably because Executor is a stone evolution. Most of them learn no new moves once they have evolved, but in some cases they get one or two. Through TM and HM, Executor is missing one move that most grass types get access to, and that's Swords Dance. Literally every other grass type gets this move, Move, Execute and Executor are the only two that don't. Another notable omission is Body Slam, but luckily it does have moves like Mega Drain, Solar Beam, and Psychic. By the way, the last of these three is the first special move it can learn. To give it some true egg flavor, it can learn the move Egg Bomb. Interestingly enough, this move is only available through TM. To me, it seems sort of like this move should have been the signature move of Execute and Executor, and it would have been a lot better if they had made it a grass type move. The reason the developers might not have wanted to do that would have been the fact that Egg Bomb is also used by Chansey. Okay, so I think we all have a sense for how awful the move pool is, but just how much of an effect is this going to have on the early game? Well, it's going to have a major impact on the early game. My only move that I can use to deal damage to the opponent is Barrage, which has base 15 power and 85% accuracy. Barrage is this line's signature move. Why isn't it a grass move? That one change alone would make this a fantastic starting set for both Execute and Executor. Because Hypnosis is quite usable in Generation 1 just because of how sleep works. Despite its 60% accuracy, when the opponent is put to sleep, when they wake up they will not have a chance to attack, giving you another opportunity to re-inflict the status condition and continue with your attacks. If we do some simple math, we can see that Hypnosis is not going to be particularly usable against Brock. Its total PP is 20, and 60% of that is 12. 10 full heals would reduce the number of usable Hypnosises to 2. Plus on the 8 turns where Hypnosis is expected to miss, Executor is just going to take damage for free. Now leveling up to 28 for Stomp is obviously out of the question, especially because Executor has a slow growth rate. Instead, I have a different strategy. I can level up to the point where Barrage is able to knock out Brock's Geodude, and once that happens, I can use the Bide Sleep interaction to hopefully defeat the Onyx. Of course, I think this is going to take at least level 13. With a lot of Pokemon when training in Viridian Forest, it is very easy to map out which trainers you can fight before making it to Pewter City and healing to replenish your power points. With Executor that isn't the case though because Barrage is so fundamentally inconsistent. While 85% accuracy is decent, the true inconsistency comes from the fact that it hits between 2 and 5 times per turn. If you get a lot of 2 and 3 turns, then you're going to have to go back to Viridian City to heal up, and if you get more 4 and 5 turns and perhaps some critical hits along the way, then it's likely that Executor will make it all the way to Pewter City. That said, there is another way around this problem, which is simply to spam out all of Hypnosis's PP and then use Struggle for the majority of the time in the forest. I took this path today because I think overall it is the most consistent and I won't bleed any time randomly walking around the overworld. I think now I have explained in depth everything that we need to account for in the early game, but I have not yet discussed Executor's stats, and this is where things get really disappointing because this thing should be a beast. It has 95 HP and attack, 85 defense, 125 special, and 55 speed, giving it a 10.55% chance to crit. Any Pokemon with 125 special should perform well in Generation 1. This is another example like Gyarados in Pokemon Yellow where a fantastic Pokemon is held back almost exclusively by its Brock split. Although we are going to talk about the portion of the game after Brock because things don't immediately get better for Executor. After the forest I head into the Pewter City Gym and fight the Junior Trainer. I defeat both of his Pokemon in a close fight using Struggle and then I backtrack to the Pokemon Center to heal. My Executor right now is level 11 and I I think if I defeat Brock's Geodude, it will level up to 12. So I decided to test Brock out now to see how it would go. After all, this is a first playthrough, so these results will not be ranking Executor.
95 base attack is decent, so I was wondering if Executor could do more than 1 damage to the Geodude per hit, but unfortunately Barrage's base power is just too low, so it looks like 1 damage per hit is all I'm gonna get. If you saw my Electabuzz, Magmar, and Jinx video earlier in the month, you will know that sleep against Brock's Onyx is very broken. What I was hoping here is that I could just barely knock the Geodude out, move on to his ace, hopefully it would go for Bide right away, I could chain Hypnosis, and finish it off. Here's the issue using that strategy with this level of Executor. By the time I defeat the Geodude, I only have 4 hit points left. Now yes, if it goes for Bide, I could trap the Onyx with Hypnosis, but that's not actually going to give me a win, because I only have 9 uses of Barrage, meaning eventually I will have to get the knockout using Struggle. So as I initially thought, more levels are going to be required. I train in the forest until level 13, and then come back to face Brock again. Now Judud is only dealing 3 damage per hit, plus my Executor has more health, so I'm able to defeat his lead with 19 hit points remaining. That is much better than last time. Against the Onyx, I'm going to start using Hypnosis, hopefully deplete all of his full heals and then just naturally put it to sleep. On the way, if I miss and it uses Bide, then I will be able to trap it in the combo, because if you didn't know, when it's accumulating energy, Brock cannot use a full heal. His AI just waits for the status condition to expire, and then it continues its bide. Starting to use Barrage against the Onyx, I am dealing so little damage, and if this move misses, I won't have enough health to knock the Onyx out using Struggle. Also, when I am using the move of Last Resort, I will have no uses of Hypnosis left, so the Onyx will wake up and be able to attack. As a result, I decided to take the reset here and train in the forest. I got a bit lucky running into the 1% Pidgeotto, which provides 145 experience points. It's nice when this thing shows up and your Pokémon is capable of knocking it out, which Executor is. I train up to level 15, and then I go back to face Brock over a damage rounding threshold. Geodude is still doing 3 damage per hit, but it looks like occasionally Barrage's hits are dealing 2 damage to it, so that is really encouraging. And in this case, I finished off with more than half health. For Onyx, it's time to use Hypnosis. This time it goes for Bide, so it's trapped asleep, and I can use Barrage to slowly whittle it down. Notably, if I mess up with my inputs, it doesn't matter that much, because Bide only accumulates damage from the first hit from Barrage every turn. I get the Onyx just under half health, and then I run out of PP. Okay, this is not a great position to be in. I'm gonna have to use my final 5 Hypnosis now. Hopefully it's gonna stay asleep for a long time after that, and this will give me the time I need for Struggle to knock it out. In Generation 1, this move deals normal type damage, so it is not very effective, meaning it will take a decent number of turns. Unfortunately, I get very bad luck with Hypnosis failing to put the Onyx to sleep, so now I just have to attack into it with Struggle. I'm not doing very much, my defense gets lowered to minus 6, Onyx goes for Bide. Okay, I think that's actually good. I will survive it, but it doesn't even unleash energy and Executor gets its first split. 18 minutes and 21 seconds. It's a slow start, very comparable to Pokemon like Kadabra and Raichu. Over the last three and a half years, I have done a lot of solo playthroughs on my channel, especially in Pokemon Yellow. So much so that when I am narrating these videos, I have some kind of standard lines that I put in in certain circumstances. Often, in a case like this, after I defeat Brock, I say something along the lines of of, well, Executor had to train to a very high level to defeat Brock, and that is advantageous because then the next few routes of the game are fairly straightforward. But for this truly awful grass psychic type, that is not the case. The reason is Barrage is not necessarily going to get me through the next route consistently. I really don't want to have to backtrack to the Pewter City Center if I can avoid it. That being said, after defeating three trainers on Route 3, I only have three PP left on Barrage, so yeah, I'm gonna go back to the Pokemon Center. The reason I'm not gonna push forward and try to use Bide is just because there is a Metapod coming up, it knows Harden, and Barrage can miss. Following that, I defeat the final bug catcher on the route, so that was minimum Pokemon and minimum battles, and then I head into Mount Moon. Here, I'll do some optional training against the Super Nerd, as well as this rocket to gain access to the Aether. This allows me to continue through the cave, even though Barrage is fairly inconsistent. I defeat the Super Nerd, pick up the Dome Fossil, and then defeat Jesse and James. This fight is fairly close because the coughing poisons me, and Barrage only has three uses left. The Cerulean City choice seems like it would be obvious. Misty is clearly the better choice right away, because the rival leads with a Spearow that knows Peck. But this is slightly complicated by the fact that inside Misty's gym, there is the Pecking Junior trainer who has a Goldeen, and this thing can be very awful. 
We saw in my Parasect video that she can be so bad, especially if your Pokemon is weak to flying type moves. The Goldeen's moveset has incredible synergy, it can confuse you with Supersonic, lower your defense with Tail Whip, then you inflict more damage to yourself, and Peck also does more damage. Unlike Parasect, Executor isn't going to have problems here, or at least it shouldn't. I am faster than the Goldeen, I have Hypnosis which can solve so many problems, and this Grass type isn't taking 4 times damage from flying moves. I defeat the Junior Trainer and now Executor is ready to take on the second Gym Leader. I wanted to go as fast as possible against Misty, and I thought that Bide and paying back damage to the star you would deal with Tackle would be the best choice. Turns out this is not in fact the case. It takes me a while to knock out the star you, and I lose a decent amount of health in the process. Against the star me, I transition to using Hypnosis and Barrage. I get a critical hit with my first one. By the way, in Generation 1, this deals the same amount on every subsequent hit, and I get a total of 5, doing half to it in one turn. From there, it stays asleep, I spam Barrage, and I earn myself the second badge. The experience from the gym is actually very helpful because Executor is now level 19, almost 20, but more importantly its speed is 34, meaning it can move first against the rival's Spiro. Hypnosis puts it to sleep, and then Barrage gets a crit and hits four times, so the Spiro goes down. Next is Sandshrew. This thing could really mess the fight up for me if it successfully uses Sand Attack, but after one scratch, my Hypnosis puts it to sleep, and I can use Barrage to knock it out. If he hasn't been able to mess you up by this point, the rest of the fight isn't going to be a problem, so the Rattata and the Eevee are easy for Executor to clean up. As I mentioned back on Route 3, one of the problems with using Barrage is the fact that you just don't have enough PP to get through areas of the game. By the time I defeat the Rocket at the end of Nugget Bridge, I only have 5 uses of Barrage left, so I don't think it's safe for me to fight the next trainer, and as a result I have to backtrack to Cerulean City to heal. The reason I didn't think I could face the next trainer is because he's a hiker, and he has a Geodude, which is going to take a long time to knock out using Barrage. I'm putting it to sleep here with Hypnosis to prevent it from using Defense Curl. If I miss and it sets up its defense, then I will just use Bide to knock it out instead. But I don't have to resort to that, Barrage is enough to finish it off. Jumping ahead in the footage, I am now traveling south towards Vermilion City. On my way, I have to face Sandy, she is this junior trainer with three Pidgeys, and the first one lowers my accuracy a grand total of four times. This leaves Barrage with a 28% chance to hit, and Hypnosis with a 19% chance to hit. Luckily for me, in exclusively Generation 1, Bide bypasses accuracy checks when it inflicts damage, so I can use this to absorb damage from Quick Attack and Gust and pay it back to the Pidgeys. I finish the second one off, but I have low health by the time the third one comes in. On the first turn I'm using Bide, it's Sand Attacks, so I accumulate less damage, dealing only half to it. Things get worse, the Pidgey crits, and Executor gets a reset. My next attempt goes much better, I make it to the third Pidgey without having my accuracy lowered, and while it does Sand Attack, it's just too late. On the SSN, I pick up the TM for rest, and then I fight the Gentleman to gain access to the rare candy. My level right now is 24, so I am still not close to getting Stomp. This means the rival battle in the SSN does have the potential to be problematic, but Barrage is dealing decent damage. I make it to the Sandshrew, I get my accuracy lowered here, but I do take it out, making it to his ace. If I really have to, I can use Bide here to bypass accuracy checks in case this thing uses Sand Attack too many times, but that doesn't end up being necessary. Okay, so it's time for Lieutenant Surge. Executor resists his most powerful move, Thunderbolt, and Mega Kick and Mega Punch won't do that much because Executor has good health as well as defense. It's a bit disappointing because the first Thunderbolt paralyzes Executor, and Barrage isn't doing very much damage. Then Raichu stacks on damage with Mega Kick, followed by a Mega Punch. I try to put it to sleep, I miss in the process, it uses Thunderbolt again, and Executor only has 15 health left. Hypnosis misses. Luckily, Raichu goes for Growl, and I put it to sleep. My next barrage hits four times, proving to me that the sleep-inducing move was the wrong choice. By the way, I tried to use Diglett's Cave to dig back to Cerulean City, but it turns out in this playthrough, because of barrage, I did have to use the Vermilion City Pokemon Center, so it looks like I just have to walk back to Cerulean City for the first time in what seems like forever. Okay, so we're level 25, we still don't have Stomp, and coming up next is the Wrapping Lass. There are two strategies here. Number one, use Barrage, try to get a 4 or 5 hit on the Oddish, knocking it out, or use Hypnosis to put it to sleep to avoid Stun Spore. Because this is my first playthrough, I played a little bit ballsy using Barrage. It hits three times, doing just more than half. Looks like I would need a 5 hit with good damage rolls in order to finish it off. 
It goes for Absorb, and I figured that was it, but then Barrage misses, and it uses Stun Spore. Okay, so now I am in the bad position. The Bellsprouts will never use Poison Powder or Sleep Powder. They will always choose between Growth and Wrap. This would probably be over if her AI had Modification 3, because then Wrap would be the only possible option. I am very thankful, because the first turn that the Bellsprout has in battle, it goes for Growth, which triggers a glitch, cutting my speed to 2, which is just interesting. The thing I'm truly thankful for is the fact that my Barrage crits, hits 3 times, and gets the knockout. Okay, so the next Oddish is going to be fairly easy, and I just need good luck against the Bellsprout. Here, it starts going for Wrap with a critical hit right away. Still, it's not doing that much damage. And after using the trapping move twice, it misses, and Barrage crits once again, finishing the next Bellsprout off. In Rock Tunnel, while I face the Pokemaniac, I realized a problem that Executor is going to have. I am going to run out of PP with Barrage if I just constantly use it to attack. That scenario is one I really want to avoid in this case, because backtracking out of the cave will mean that I no longer have the required number of repels to get through without wild encounters. Using Bide instead is a nice way to conserve Barrage PP, but it does come at the cost of my HP. So after the battle, I teach Executor Rest, because this is going to be useful very soon against the self-destructing Hiker. Because I want to conserve my PP, and I have good defensive stats, I can just use Rest throughout this entire fight, wait for all of his Pokémon to use self-destruct, heal, and move on to the next one. This gives me a decisive win. Facing the mandatory gambler between Lavender Town and Celadon City, I finally level up to 28, and here Executor learns Stomp. And the moveset upgrades are not going to stop here. After a brief trip into the Rocket Hideout, grabbing a rare candy, and then a stop by the department store to purchase 4 calcium, I walk east into Saffron City and obtain the TM for Psychic. At long last, this Grass Psychic type is going to be able to utilize its best stat. Pokemon Tower is the first time we get to see its dominance. After the longest time using Barrage, it is so satisfying one-hitting every single Pokemon on a trainer's team. The Chandler and the Tower are of course trivial because Psychic is super effective against their poison types, and on the date that I was recording this run, which was August 12th, I was thinking that fighting the Chandlers with Haunter would be a good idea. They give decent stat experience for both Special and Speed, and as middle stage Pokemon, they both give decent experience yields. That is, when compared with the other Chandler in the tower with Ghastly. After doing my mid-game research in September, I figured out that these trainers are actually not good to fight, therefore these battles are just a mistake in this run due to my lack of knowledge. I crushed the through Jesse and James at the top of the tower, head through Cycling Road. I'm fighting no optional trainers here, which again is a knowledge error. And this continues in Erica's gym, because I'm going to fight every single trainer here. This is likely the last time for a while that we're going to see this montage of me walking through the gym, fighting every trainer, cutting the tree effortlessly without any menuing, and I'm a bit sad about that. I have enjoyed putting this sequence together in the past, but it's not going to be useful anymore because these trainers give bad experience yields, with the exception of the cool trainer. With all of that grinding out of the way, let's take on Erica. Tangle is first, I stack up worst against it, but Psychic does more than half. It goes for Constrict, which crits, but luckily doesn't lower my speed. If it had, I still wouldn't be worried, because the Weeping Bell and the Gloom are both going to be locked into using Acid, and I only need one use of Psychic on each of them to get the knockouts. The victory here gives me access to the Mega Drain TM, but I'm not going to use it right away. Instead, I go to Koga's gym next, fighting the two mandatory trainers before taking him on. I figured this battle would be possible right away because I outspeed all three of the Venonats. My prediction was that Psychic is going to get three one-hits, and I was correct. His Venomoth is last, and this Bug Poison type has four times damage in the form of Leech Life. Note in Generation 1 this move has 20 base power. Look at how much it did to Executor. That is actually a significant amount. My Psychic doesn't get the one hit, giving Venomoth another chance to go for the recovery move. This heals it, but not enough, and Executor knocks it out. I've earned myself the Soul Badge, and with it comes a 12.5% boost to my speed, as well as the ability to use Surf outside of battle. I'm immediately going to employ the field move to journey to the power plant, where I can pick up one additional rare candy. I wanted this for the late game, after all Executor is a slow growth rate Pokemon. In Sylph I fight the optional Machoke Trainer to get one more rare candy, and then I fight the Arbok guy who is mandatory. The rival here could be problematic, the Sand Slash can use Sand Attack, Cloyster has Aurora Beam, the Magneton can use Sonic Boom or Super Sonic, the Kadabra could stall me out with Recover and potentially confuse with both of its Psychic moves. And if I make it through all of that, the Flareon can use Ember as well as Fire Spin. A surprising amount goes wrong in this fight, and by the time I defeat the Kadabra, I have less than half health remaining. 
If you've seen my videos before, you might wonder why I didn't go up against the Jolteon team. If you know Pokemon Yellow really well, you will realize that the Flareon is by far easier to face. I'm faster than it, so I'm able to hit Psychic right away, doing half. This lowers its special, meaning that the following Ember does very little damage, and I knock it out on the next turn. For the fight against Giovanni, note that I have taught Mega Drain, and I did this in the place of Hypnosis. Throughout the mid-game, I have been realizing how strong Executor really is. I don't think that relying on a sleep and inducing move is the correct choice from here. After being given Mimic, I go into the Saffron City Gym to face the Psychic type specialist. Executor is very slow. I don't think there's going to be a way to outspeed Sabrina's Pokemon, so I might as well just fight them now. After all, her Pokemon are frail, so Stomp is going to do decent damage. But the Kadabra does a lot with Psychic, followed by Psy Wave, leaving me with only 20 hit points. Alakazam is next, she uses X Defend turn 1, and I use Rest Healing. It misses a Psy Wave, fails to recover, I wake up, and just before I go for Stomp, it sets up with Reflect. The best choice now is to use my special moves to knock it out. I'm choosing Psychic, which might seem strange. It has a higher effective power when compared with Mega Drain, and it also has the chance to lower the Alakazam's special, which will speed up my progress. The only problem I'll have here is if the Alakazam continuously uses Recover, which by the way, it would if this was red and blue. But in Pokemon Yellow, she doesn't have AI Modification 3, meaning she's going to randomly select moves. I just need to wait for the time when Alakazam doesn't use Recover, eventually it happens, and I finish her ace off. I have to face Blaine next. I want to draw your attention to the fact that my Executor is level 39 going into this fight. I have done so little optional training in the later stages of the game because after obtaining Psychic, this thing has sort of been on a rampage. Of course that's going to stop now because Blaine is in fact a fire type specialist. To make the odds a little bit more in my favor, I fight two trainers in the gym going up to 40 before trying again. I get some bad luck with Confusion, but finally when Executor hits with Psychic, it's just not doing very much. I'm gonna need to do more training. A fast option for Executor is the Fighting Dojo. There are so many trainers clustered closely together, and I have super effective damage against all of them. I come back to Blaine's Gym to fight more trainers, and level up to 43. I'm just barely not getting 2 hit range, well, that is, if I don't get a crit. Rapidash is next, it has lower special, so I assume I'm gonna two-shot this thing, and yes, that's what happens. Last is Arcanine, it goes for takedown, missing, that's nice. Psychic gets a crit and does so much, I know now I'll be able to knock it out with my next turn. But that's if I get one, because the Arcanine just goes for flamethrower and executor faints. Alright, I've definitely put it off long enough, it's time to use rare candies. Out of my 11, I use 7 to go up to level 50. This massive jump in level gives me a 2 hit against the Ninetales as well as the Rapidash. Well, if I was actually able to outspeed it. Ninetales did badge boost me, but I am 1 short, so the Rapidash is able to finish me off again. I use 3 more rare candies to boost Executor up to level 53. This has a distinct advantage because I'm now faster than the Ninetales. Also, I crit and Psychic 1 shots. Alright, that is a good start. Next is Rapidash, it's faster, so it's able to trap me with Fire Spin if it really wants to. I should mention if Blaine had AI Modification 3, he would just spam this move, and it would be very hard for Executor to win without leveling more. My Psychic takes it to red health when I finally move, it goes for takedown, Executor survives on red health, and then I decided to use Rest to heal before facing the Arcanine. This turns out to come back to bite me in a very strange way. The Rapidash uses takedown, knocking itself out, so I am still asleep for the Arcanine. It goes for Fire Blast, crits, and Executor faints. Okay, when that doesn't happen and I make it to the Arcanine, I have green health. Psychic does more than half. What will Arcanine do? In this case, it'll just use Reflect, which is useless. So I have cleared 7 of 8 gyms. There's only one more to go. Here, I face just the two mandatory trainers, and then I go up against Giovanni. The Dugtrio can cause a reset because it knows Fissure and it outspeeds. It just chooses Dig, actually getting a critical hit which does decent damage, but Mega Drain just knocks it out, recovering all of the lost HP. That's the first time that I've used Mega Drain on screen, by the way. The only other time that I did use it was against Giovanni's Rhyhorn in Sylph. Persians next, I use Psychic to knock it out, and from here things get easier. I outspeed both the Nidoqueen and the Nidoking, and for the Rhydon, I have 4 times damage in the form of Mega Drain. That was a quick and simple finale to the gym challenge.
My biggest fear against the rival on Route 22 was that the Execute was going to paralyze Executor. With that status condition, I would move second against the Cloister and the Flareon and potentially have a reset. Instead, the Grass type uses Poison Powder, which is great because now I can't be paralyzed. Mega Drain is also able to one hit the Cloister, and the Magneton is never going to use Thunder Wave against me because it's an electric move. Stomp does more than half to the Kadabra, its Psychic moves will not do very much, so that leaves only the Flareon. Psychic does more than half, it goes for Flamethrower, its most powerful move, but Executor shrugs it off and gets the win. Because I'm about to level up, I decided to fight a trainer in Victory Road, and this gives me a little bit more experience towards 57, so at the end of the cave I fought these two cool trainers in order to level up to 57. I don't have very many rare candies left over, and with a slow growth rate, this is going to be a very low level finish. I'm getting a little bit worried that I haven't trained enough in this run. Hopefully, the Elite Four is not going to be a problem. Lorelei is an interesting case. While her ice moves are super effective against Executor, Mega Drain is good against 4 for 5 Pokemon. I knock out the Dugong over 2 hits, Cloister's next, it has low special. Mega Drain takes it to red health, which triggers Lorelei to use a super potion, so I knock it out and move on to the Slowbro with full health. Ordinarily here, mimicking Amnesia would be the best choice, but I don't have access to that move right now. I'm holding on to Stomp for the Champion's Alakazam, as well as for Lorelei's Jinx. It's able to hit with Ice Punch twice, but it doesn't freeze. Last is Lapras. I go for Mega Drain, but it does less than half, and then Blizzard takes me to red health. Okay, this is uh, not looking very good. I take it down to the red, it hits with one more Blizzard, gets a crit, and Executor faints. I started that fight under a damage rounding threshold, I use one rare candy to go up to level 58 before trying again. Back at the Jinx I have full health, Stomp flinches, Lorelei uses two super potions, giving me the free knockout. Alright, I've made it to the Lapras with full health, I'm gonna go for Psychic here just in case I get a special drop. While I don't, it did do more than half. But then Blizzard hits and it freezes. With no way to defrost in Generation 1 outside of using an item, I have lost this fight. It's fairly easy to make it back to the Lapras. In this case, my Psychic does get a special drop. Blizzard doesn't do enough, so I've made it past the first League member. And for this Grass Psychic type, the next member of the League is Lance. Okay, maybe I shouldn't get too overconfident. I do have a chance to lose to Agatha due to confusion and hypnosis, but I have rest and I resist her moves. Plus, ghost type attacks do not affect the psychic type in Generation 1. So yeah, she's defeated and we are moving on to Lance. Before this fight, I need a way to defeat his dragons quickly, and I think it is time to give up Stomp, even though it's just before the champion. So I'm going to teach Mimic in its place. His first team member is Gyarados. Psychic does more than half, it lowers my defense with Leer, and I knock it out. The first Dragonair would only use Slam or Hyper Beam if Psychic didn't just one-hit it. But the second Dragonair is going to spam Ice Beam. And because I want to mimic this move, it's going to get one chance to freeze. It doesn't pull it off, and from there, I knock it out. Now the defense drop could be problematic because the Aerodactyl has Wing Attack and Fly. It chooses the more powerful move in this case, gets a critical hit, and Executor faints. In the next battle I have less health coming out of the second Dragonair because it crit with Ice Beam. Once again Aerodactyl goes for Fly, but it just misses, so Ice Beam does the job and the Dragonite that follows is also a one hit. I use my final rare candy and now it's time to take on the Champion, who is typically the strongest trainer in Yellow version. His lead is Sandslash, and it knows the move Poison Sting, because it sees my Grass type. This is the only move it is ever going to use. I know that I have time to use Mimic here to steal Earthquake, which is going to be very advantageous against the following Alakazam, as well as the later Magneton and Flareon. Even when the Sandslash poisons me, I'm not worried, because I can always use Rest to heal the status condition against his Executor. Executor's speed is a liability against the Alakazam, because it can move first and potentially use Kinesis. In this case, it just fails a full health recover. I go for Earthquake, and it does enough to knock out. Okay, that is really good. Executor is next. I'm going to go for Psychic here to hopefully lower its special fairly soon. Because of my typing, it's locked into Barrage and Stomp, so after bringing it to red health, I use Rest to heal before proceeding with the battle. 
The Magneton that follows is unsurprisingly not a one hit with Earthquake, but it won't use its electric type moves due to type effectiveness. Now Cloyster could freeze me if it survives, but it has a 50% chance of using Ice Beam, and Aurora Beam just lowers attack. In this case it does choose the more potent move, but it doesn't inflict the status condition, and I move on to the Flareon. In this case, it's going to be choosing between Fire Spin and Flamethrower, it's very good that I'm faster than it, and it doesn't matter anyways, because Earthquake gets a critical hit. So, Executor clocks in with a first playthrough time of 1 hour 19 minutes and 6 seconds with 11 resets at level 63. This is a game time of 4 hours and 47 minutes. I put together some graphics comparing Raichu and Kadabra to Executor's performance because I think these three Pokemon are fairly similar. They all have slow Brock splits, but then accelerate through the mid to late portions of the game. While Raichu was faster off the line when compared to Kadabra and Executor, it slows down throughout the mid game, having to train for the champion. That isn't the case for both Kadabra and Executor. And while the grass type did have the worst first attempt of the three, overall I would say it felt the most solid. The pre-stomp portion of the game is very frustrating, but after that, the whole game becomes trivial. It feels very similar to the two playthroughs that I did with both Abra and Execute. It's clear that Game Freak took a certain approach when designing psychic types. They wanted them to be quite hard to train early on, usually due to the fact that they get access to very few useful moves. But once they start rolling with good special damage, then they are fairly unstoppable. This timeline graphic really shows how much time Executor loses in the Surge and Erika split. And that's because unlike Kadabra and Raichu, it is fighting with the slow growth rate. If we look at levels by trainer, we can see that here with Executor, it is the lowest level of the three all the way until Blaine, because I used rare candies. While it does end up finishing the game at a higher level than Kadabra, I think that is largely because I overtrained. For my refined route, I want to improve these three areas. I want to minimize time spent in the Surge and Erika split, figure out the best possible location to place rare candies, and hopefully finish the game at a lower level, saving a lot of optional battles and time. Unlike a lot of my recent videos, I did not challenge my Discord to run Executor, so these thoughts are mostly derived from my own experience with the Pokemon. That said, Ike the Killer did post some screenshots and one key piece of insight which I ended up including in my route. I'll mention it when I get there. In the early game, the most important thing is to face Brock as soon as possible. In order to do this, in the Viridian City Mart, I'm going to buy 10 potions, which will extend the amount of time that I can train using Struggle. In the forest, I fight the first bug catcher right away. As you can see from the footage continuing, my PP after this fight is only 7 on Barrage, and this is actually good, because I can fight the next bug catcher who has 2 Metapod. The reason I want to be fighting him with low Barrage PP is so I can knock out the first Metapod and hopefully the Caterpie, and then spam out Hypnosis on the second Metapod, getting to struggle as fast as possible. Doing things this way gives me both trainer boosted experience and a reliable way to find a metapod so I don't take damage in the process of depleting my PP. That said, I run out of barrage too early and I have to spam out hypnosis on the Caterpie. It's not the end of the world, this thing is level 6 so it's quite weak. After grinding on wild Pokemon, I fight the Lass at level 9. Executor can be messed up in this fight by Growl on the first Nidoran female, so that's why I want one more level to take her on. At level 10, I take on the Bug Catcher with two Pokemon. These are both level 8, so I wanted another level for them. As you can see here, the Metapod also has Tackle, so I need to be a little bit more careful. Then I defeat the Mandatory Bug Catcher and the Junior Trainer in Brock's Gym, bringing Executor to level 12. In my previous run, I fought Brock at level 15, and this is definitely the more consistent approach, but in this playthrough, I'm going to fight him at level 13. This usually requires only one trip to the forest, all of Barrage's PP will get me to the level I need, and then I can fight him. In this case though, I have some bad luck, so I have to go back and fight two more wild Pokemon just south of the Pokemon Center. With level 13, I am ready to face Brock. This fight is fairly simple, I'm just going to take the Geodude out as fast as possible, hopefully having around 23 to 26 hit points left over, then I can put the Onix to sleep and knock it out. Of course, as we saw in my first playthrough, there is the possibility to lose here, and I would say that overall it is the more likely outcome. That said, when doing multiple playthroughs, this strategy isn't that risky. For example, beating Brock at a low level with Weezing was more challenging than doing it here with Executor. In this case, the fight is as close as is possible. The Onyx gets a bind in, taking my Executor down to two hit points, and my last struggle does one hit point of damage, so I survive on one health and proceed with the playthrough. 
Throughout the rest of the run, I'm going to document every single optional battle that I take part in so that you know exactly how this run works. On Route 3, I'm going to fight a total of six trainers. The Mandatory Bug Catcher, Youngster Ben, the Lass, the then Optional Bug Catcher, and the Mandatory Final Bug Catcher. This is five trainers, and I wanted to fight the Lass that's right here, but unfortunately I don't have enough barrage uses left over to do it. So I have to go to the Mount Moon Pokemon Center, heal, and then backtrack to this fight to get the experience. It's a little bit of a time loss, but I want to make sure that everything lines up perfectly with my experience. Improvising in the final run never is a good idea. Inside Mount Moon, I continue my extensive training. I fight a total of eight trainers here. The Bug Catcher by the entrance, the Lass by the sign, the Super Nerd and Bug Catcher by the rare candy, the Lass with two grass types, the Rocket by the ether, the Youngster at the end of the first area, and finally the optional Rocket in the basement. After reaching Cerulean City, I continue my optional training, fighting the Swimmer in Misty's Gym. That brings Executor to level 19, and once you defeat the Junior Trainer's Goldeen, it levels up to 20 to face Misty. This fight is extremely simple. Here I'm using Bide. This is just because it's faster than using Barrage and Hypnosis. While it is slightly more risky, my goal in this run is going to be top speed. Once I defeat her ace, Executor levels up to 21. And now, I should let you know what my early game goal is. I want to get Executor to level 25 as fast as is humanly possible. And I'm going to fight two more optional trainers on the SSN in order to do that. Notably here, I am picking up the Aether beside Rest, and I really want you to hold on to that for later on. I wanted to skip this area entirely to save time, but I needed the Aether because my luck was very bad against the trainers on the previous route, and I don't have enough barrage uses left to get to 25. With the Aether, I fight the Gentleman, pick up the third rare candy, and then I fight the last that is right beside him. Defeating her Jigglypuff gives me the experience I need to level up to 25, and then I can use three rare candies to boost Executor to level 28. This is the fantastic idea that I got from Ike. Access to Stomp really early on is going to speed up both the Surge and the Erika split. It does come at the cost of having to do a lot more early game training, but I think it's worth it. I can take decisive victories against the rival on the SSN, as well as Surge using this powerful normal type move. For the wrapping last, we should go through damage ranges. I have a 59% chance to one hit the Oddish using Stomp. In this case, I don't get it, but luckily it poisons me, so I have nothing left to fear in this fight because I outspeed and have guaranteed one shots on both of the Bells. Route. In Rock Tunnel, due to the fact that I skipped Rest, I have to defeat the Hiker using either Hypnosis and Stomp or Bide. Honestly, the second option is faster, because if the Geodude self-destructs, you accumulate so much energy and then just one-shot his next Pokemon, which is what happens here. Plus, Executor is overleveled, has a lot of HP and defense, so his hits don't do that much, as is evident by the fact that the Graveler's self-destruct takes me down to around half health. I fight the rocket to gain access to the game corner, and then grab one additional rare candy. In the department store, I buy three Carbos, and then on Cycling Road I fight two trainers, the Weezing Duo. In the Celadon Gym I fight the Cool Trainer, and then crush Erica. She is very easy. In Sylph, I fight two optional trainers, the Machoke guy to get the rare candy, as well as this trainer who has a Machop and Machoke. Generally, he does not give good experience yields, but I just need a little bit more in this case, and I didn't want to fight a trainer who has a lot of Pokemon on their team. After this fight, I teach Executor Mega Drain. Just look at my experience bar, I am about to level up. So when I face the mandatory Rocket with the Arbok and defeat his only Pokemon, I level up to 36, and I can use four rare candies to boost Executor up to level 40. I'm intentionally using my rare candies early into this run because Executor does not need a high level at finish. Instead, it just needs more consistency throughout the mid game so it doesn't lose any time. The rival battle in Sylph can be a little bit tricky because the Sand Slash is going to have an opportunity to poison with Poison Sting. The Cloister can use Aurora Beam and potentially get a crit, which is what happens here. Following that, Magneton can do damage with Sonic Boom or Confuse with Super Sonic, and the Kadabra could potentially confuse because it has a 23% chance to survive my Stomp. After all of that, I'm going to two-hit the Flareon, and it can of course use Fire Spin or Ember. Of course, if it looks like a lot of these factors are conspiring against me, when I make it to the Flareon or Kadabra, I can always start using Hypnosis if I know they're going to knock me out. So even when it's in a bad position, Executor still has some play. In Koga's Gym, I face the first Tamer as well as the second Tamer for extra experience, and then I battle the Poison-type Gym Leader. 
This fight is trivial, I have guaranteed one hits on all the Venonats, and a 36% chance to knock the Venomoth out in one hit. Following this win, I boost Executor from level 44 to level 47 using three rare candies. This brings me painfully close to getting a speed tie with Sabrina's Abra, but in the end it doesn't really matter because Executor resists all of her attacks. Psywave is the most intimidating attack in this battle, and when that's the case, you know that you're gonna win. Although I will say it got really close today, I survive on 20 hit points and knock the Alakazam out due to a crit. The next battle is much more sketchy, it's against Blaine. I'm gonna put his Pokemon to sleep because Executor does not have one hit ranges on any of them. Plus, it's not able to move first. Minimizing the number of turns that he can choose a fire move is paramount. With Psychic, I have an 87% chance to knock out the Nine Tails in two hits, and a guarantee on the Rapidash. Following that, I have a 20% chance to two hit the Arcanine, and in this run, despite getting a three hit on it, I do pull off the first attempt of victory. There are three ways to lose against Giovanni. The Dugtrio uses Fissure, the Dugtrio uses Sand Attack, or the Dugtrio and the Persian deal enough damage to knock Executor out. Because the resets come very early into the fight, it is safe to face him now, because the resets will be quick. In this case though, I don't even have a single one. And that's what my strategy is trying to do, set up a good balance of risk and reward. The rival before the league is fairly straightforward. The only way I could lose here is if the Execute uses Stun Spore on me, but if that happened, I would just reset immediately. In this case, it doesn't, so I make it all the way to his Flareon, put it to sleep, and knock it out using Psychic. Okay, so we're going to speed through the league. I have now taught Executor Mimic because I'm going to steal Slowbro's Amnesia and Setup. This both increases my speed and my special. I am doing this for a critical reason. In previous playthroughs, the Jinx used Ice Punch on me because I did not have enough speed, and it froze Executor a couple times. These resets were so painful, so I decided to optimize my strategy around one hitting both it and the following Lapras. The next trainer with some inconsistency is Lance. The Gyarados can do damage because I'm going to have to two hit it. It, and the second Dragonair could freeze me if I miss with Hypnosis and it gets lucky. But the real inconsistency comes at the Aerodactyl. After I have mimicked Ice Beam, I only have a 79% chance to one-hit it. And when it uses Fly, it has a guaranteed one-hit in the case that it crits. These odds are good enough for me, provided there is one other thing in place, and that's Executor's speed. While I did receive a badge boost at the beginning of the battle, this was reset when the first Dragonair came out, so I have a natural 115 speed after that level up. This means I have one more than the following Dragonite, and it is never going to use Blizzard or Fire Blast. In my practice runs, this ended up happening several times causing massive time delays, and it's the primary reason that I chose to get Carbos in the department store. Alright, so Lance is defeated, and when the Dragonite faints, the time on the clock is 54 minutes, and 43 seconds. My goal for this playthrough was a sub one hour time. And in every other run that I had done to this point, I had failed to achieve that goal. So let's see how the champion is. Sandslash is first, it's always going to spam Poison Sting, and the loss condition here is if it poisons you. It will have the chance to do this because I'm going to be mimicking Earthquake, and of course right away it poisons Executor, so that's my first reset. I tried the fight again, and immediately it poisons me again. I genuinely let out like a uh, sound when this happened, and my wife turned to me and was like, is everything okay? Yeah, Sandslash is just being frustrating, as is typically the case. In the third battle, I'm able to use Mega Drain and knock it out, moving on to the Alakazam. Now the loss condition here is if it goes for Kinesis, and it's going to be randomizing its move selection, so this is a 1 in 4 chance. And of course, it goes for Kinesis right away. Because I had two frustrating resets with Poison Powder, I decided to keep trying, but then it uses Kinesis again and with that, it's safer to just reset. In the fourth fight, everything goes as planned. I don't get poisoned, I make it past the Alakazam without having my accuracy lowered, and then on the Executor, I'm going to put it to sleep and use Psychic to knock it out. This takes time, but it is consistent. Against the Magneton, I'm going to make what looks like a weird choice. I'm using Mega Drain instead of Earthquake. The reason is the champion's AI is selecting between Swift and Screech, and I specifically want him to use Screech to badge boost Executor. If you were paying very close attention, you will know that I didn't talk about the rare candy in Victory Road, and I also haven't used any candies since the point that I could have obtained it. That's because I just skipped it. If you use it, you level up right before the cloister in this fight, and by doing that you can't badge boost on this Magneton. But by skipping the candy, you both save time and level up going into the Executor and then after the Flareon. With no badge boost, I only knock out his final Flareon if I get a critical hit. With one badge boost, I have a 66% chance to knock it out, and with two 
blue, I get a guaranteed one hit. Unfortunately for me, the Magneton just doesn't badge boost at all, so I knock it out and have to move on. That's kind of annoying, but I still could be fine. And then the Cloister uses Ice Beam, and uh, we're gonna do a freeze frame right here. Look at the clock, it's at 57 minutes and 33 seconds. Because of this status condition, the sub hour time might be slipping through my fingers. Okay, everything just needs to go according to plan, and Sandslash poisons. Not once, not twice, but three times in a row. I will have you know, Poison Sting only has a 20% chance to inflict this status condition. Also, every time I reset the game, I am trying to make sure that the RNG progresses a different amount of time, so I'm just getting very unlucky. And in this case, it continues because for a fourth time in a row, the Sand Slash poisons, causing my eighth reset. Yes, all of these resets have occurred during the fight against the champion. In the next fight, the Sandslash doesn't poison, the Alkazam does not lower my accuracy, and then after defeating the Executor, the Magneton successfully screeches me once. I crit the Cloister, knocking it out with a single Mega Drain, and then I use Earthquake hoping for the good roll on the Flareon. But of course, it survives, and it uses Flamethrower, but luckily it doesn't get a critical hit, and Executor finally clocks in, with a final time of 59 minutes and 54 seconds, with 8 extremely unlucky and frustrating resets at level 56. This is a game time of 3 hours and 42 minutes. I did 6 Executor playthroughs, and these are not particularly quick because sometimes you have restarts to Brock. There is also a lot of other content that I have to film, so at this point I just had to call it a day, and we're gonna have to rank it based on these results. However, I think it should be obvious to you that it can get a faster time. I think something in the range of 56 minutes is possible, but if I went back in to play this run again, I would be shooting for a 57 to 58 minute time. I think that that's a little bit more realistic. Recently I've been trying to examine my own biases with these playthroughs, and I think I overuse the move Rest. While in a lot of cases it does make the playthroughs more consistent, sometimes you bleed more time just healing, when a fast reset would allow you to get a lower real time. But when I come back to do this run again, I am definitely going to be using it, because it makes the champion so much more consistent. I can heal poison from the Sand Slash, so that doesn't matter anymore, and then against the Magneton, I can buy a lot of time and get as many screeches as I want. It doesn't solve the Alakazam or the Cloister, but the Alakazam is a fast reset, and the Cloister is only a 10% chance to freeze. Though his odds are so much better, and I definitely wouldn't have had 8 resets if I had had rest. One metric that I don't often spend a lot of time talking about is level of finish. I think of the 4 primary metrics I record, this one is the least important. But today, Executor sets a new standard for lowest level at completion. I have not completed the game with any other Pokemon at level 56. The next best finish that I have is Starmie at level 57. Interestingly, another Psychic type that also has the slow growth rate. That said, let's bring up the tier list because today, Executor's results are nowhere near Starmie's. With a time just under an hour, it is the slowest Pokemon in the C tier. It's hilarious to me that Scyther clocked in with a better time, that run required a lot of RNG, and Executor felt like the complete opposite when I was planning it. Everything except Brock felt very consistent, and there was a little bit of inconsistency against the champion, but I never dreamed it would cause 8 resets and this much time lost. Of course, I'll be back to replay this one on stream sometime in the future, probably sometime in January, because overall I'm pretty frustrated with this final run. If you support me directly, it means the world to me, thank you so much. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. Daily December continues tomorrow with a playthrough of Pokemon Emerald using only a Salamence. I am really excited for that one. But don't worry, this video isn't done yet, because we have to take on Professor Oak. As we start this section, I just want to say I put this in here for fun. I am never ranking Pokemon based on this fight. It is purely entertainment value. For one, Oak's team is not that interesting. Sometimes he has two Pokemon that share the same type, and his movesets are really bad for Pokemon Yellow standards. When I fight him, I generally don't want to level up, and I also don't want to teach my Pokemon new moves. I want to try to defeat him in the state that the Pokemon came out of the champion fight in. There are three Professor Oak teams in the ROM, and I want to battle the one that is strongest against my Pokemon. In this case, that's the Charizard team. 
and that presents Executor with a significant problem. Because I finished the game at a very low level, I am not faster than the Arcanine and the Charizard. Oak does have AI modification 3, so the Arcanine is going to spam Ember, and the Charizard is going to use either Flamethrower or Fire Spin. If I am preventing myself from leveling up, and I can't learn new moves, then what are my choices against these two fire types? For the first few battles, I thought Charizard was going to have to miss with Fire Spin. But then I discovered a hilarious strategy. I can use Mimic to steal the Tauros's Tail Whip or Leer, and then I can use this move or Mega Drain to buy time, and hopefully it will lower my defense three times so that I have 169 speed. This gives me the ability to move first against both fire types, but I am going to have to get Hypnosis on the Executor, the Arcanine, the Charizard, and likely the Gyarados. Giving any of these Pokemon a chance to attack means I will take way too much damage. The Executor's Barrage and Stomp do a lot because I have minus 3 defense, and then the Arcanine can burn me with Ember or just do a lot of damage. Plus with Hypnosis I am going to miss at some point, and I want as much health as is possible. While Hypnosis is very risky, it is a tool that can preserve your health throughout the entire fight. This took me a long time to get a successful attempt. I fought Oak a total of 8 18 times. Finally, I managed to put the Gyarados to sleep and knock it out. That's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next one.